Hello everybody and welcome back to MI212. This is Mark Astongay again and uh, today our topic is a continuation of some advanced PKPD modeling um, ideas. Uh, we're going to focus today on what we call advanced PK topics one uh, which will include issues such as parameter identifiability, nonlinear pharmacokinetics, time-dependent pharmacokinetics, and also target-mediated drug disposition. All of these are interrelated in, um, in the way that we uh, think about them from a pharmacokinetic point of view, also as how you might implement them in a modeling software such as NonMem. Before we get started today, I just wanted to uh, remind you that uh, this is your uh, exam week. Uh, we posted the exam last Friday. Uh, and uh, we will be closing that exam uh, at the end of the day this Friday. So please uh, do complete that exam if, uh, if, if you would like to receive uh, a certificate for credit of this course. Um, for those of you, again, who are taking the um, Pharmacometrics Certificate Program, you know that you've got to average a, a grade of B or better. Okay, so let's move on with this current topic. And um, we'll start by defining parameter identifiability. Um, if you've read some of the background or uh, are familiar with this topic, you'll know that there are different classifications of parameter identifiability. And the two major classes here are a priori identifiability and a posteriori identifiability. And just as the Latin might indicate one is the, the prior identifiability or your, your identifiability before you conduct the experiment. This is also known as mathematical identifiability. And sp specifically speaking, it's the unique mathematical identifiability of model parameters. Uh, for example, we, we might ask the question, can unique estimates be obtained for the model parameters given ideal, error-free data from the study design? assuming the model is correct, of course, and so we're not working with a misspecified model. So under perfect circumstances of experimental design, are the parameters of the model identifiable? So this really has to do with the mathematical construct and uh, re is independent of, of the study design. Now, of course, you know, you could satisfy this requirement, um, but not meet the requirement for a posteriori identifiability. A posteriori identifiability has to do with the study design. It's not the mathematical um, uh, requirement. It's the uh, data collection requirement here in the study design. So the sensitivity of parameter estimation to available data. So for example, can the model or parameters be estimated with ad adequate ad accuracy and precision given the observed data? Okay, I'm getting some feedback here uh, on the uh, uh, question board that there's some echo in the audio. I'm just going to take a moment here to, to see if, if there's anything that's, uh, that could be improved. Um, but we've got our default settings, I believe, all around. Well, please uh, let us know if you continue to have difficulties with audio. Uh, we're, everything is set up as we typically would would do so, um, and uh, send uh, your send your questions directly to Joe Hebert, um, or he'll pick up on on the question board. I'm going to continue with the lecture here, uh, and uh, we are also recording as we move along. Um, so if the audio is choppy due to connectivity on your end, potentially, um, we should not have that problem with the recording. Um, okay, so getting on with, with, with the topics here, uh, we've defined a priori and a posteriori identifiability. Now, of course, these are Uh, 
of course, these are, um, okay, it looks like we're getting a barrage of messages uh, with audio quality. Um, I'm going to take a break then just for five minutes and we'll restart. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm not sure what the problem is, but we'll investigate here. Give me five minutes and we'll restart and uh, uh, hopefully you'll all hear. connected I don't know. Everything's everything's set up correctly here. It just must be our connectivity. We're not sure. Um, we'll record, right? Okay, let's try it again. Okay, we've checked everything on our end here, and uh, there doesn't appear to be any problem here. Um, I'm going to continue with the class. I'll, st I'll actually start over for those of you who had uh, some difficulties hearing. But uh, I, I really don't have another solution at this point. It may be, um, yeah, it may, it may be something to do with go to webinar. We've got to call into their technical support right now to see if there's a problem. So let me um, let me back up, and we'll start again um, from the top. And please do tell us if this uh, audio problem seems to have, have been resolved. The topic today is uh, uh, an overview of uh, pharmacokinetic topics 
including parameter identifiability, nonlinear pharmacokinetics, time-dependent pharmacokinetics, and target-mediated drug disposition. We'll tackle the first topic, parameter identifiability. And this is a concept that is divided into two major types of parameter identifiability, uh, both a priori or a posteriori identifiability uh, have to be considered when applying a model to data sets. The a priori identifiability, as the name would indicate, is something that, that happens before you, you even consider the experimental design. Uh, it's, it's also known as mathematical identifiability and is basically some assurance that you have a unique math mathematical identifiability of all of the model parameters. Can you obtain any uh, unique estimates for the parameters given perfect data? So ideal error-free data from the study design, assuming the model is, is correct as well. So you have the best of all worlds there, uh, as long as the experiment is, is uh, uh, not an issue, a priori identifiability then becomes just a mathematical problem. And we'll see that sometimes if we have a model that's that's over-parameterized given the, the sampling design that we have, um, that uh, identifiability on the a priori sense uh, becomes a problem. But then there's a posteriori identifiability, which is completely dependent upon the study design itself. So you may have a system that is a priori identifiable or mathematically identifiable, um, but the sensitivity of the parameter estimation to the available data is the problem. Sometimes this, an experiment is not designed optimally and um, the, the problem ends up with, with parameter estimation giving an inadequate design, whereas the, the posed model m might be completely identifiable. Well, within a priori identifiability, we can group into a couple of categories, actually three different categories. Uh, one is globally identifiable. So that's a solution that is mathematically identifiable for, for all sets of parameters in that there's a single unique set of parameter estimates mathematically for that model. And it's for that model under the particular sampling scenario um, the sampling pool that, that you're uh, observing in the data set. You could have a locally identifiable model, and that's one where the solution to the estimation problem consists of a finite number of sets of parameter values. So you may not have a unique set across all the parameters. There may be some of the parameters that, uh, that actually uh, have a couple of solutions, um, but there's a finite number of solutions for the system. And in that case, the analyst is left with the uh, responsibility to decide which set of solutions um, is most appropriate for, for their particular purpose. And then you have unidentifiable systems a priori, and those are mathematically unidentifiable, where the solution to the estimation problem consists of an infinite number of sets of parameter values. So let's look at an example. Here's a two compartment model that in its present implementation is unidentifiable. And let's just orient you to, to the notation here. So you have a two compartment system with first order rate constants for both exiting from compartment one and compartment two. So it might be a central and peripheral compartment for a PK system. We also have um, first order transfers between the compartments K12 and K21. Notice that the only place where data are sampled is compartment one. It's also the same compartment for dosing. So in this system here, there is no unique solution to the parameters because you have exit from both compartment one and compartment two, but you only have sampling from compartment one. So if you're able to obtain data observations from compartment two, this system would now become a priori identifiable 
but in the current implementation, it is not identifiable. So that's, that's unidentifiable. Now here's one where we have a local identifiability problem. Assume a one compartment model with first order absorption, which we would describe with this particular equation here, just in general terms. Uh, we have concentration at a particular time defined by an absorption rate constant times bioavailability fraction times dose divided by volume of distribution times the absorption rate constant minus the elimination rate constant and then, and then again, multiplied by the quantity e to the minus kt minus e to the minus kat. That's a simple one compartment model that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, but this is one that can lead to difficulties with identifiability uh, in, in that local identifiability can become a problem. Um, for example, um, there are potentially two sets of solutions here for ka and k. Um, what we call flip-flop kinetics. And so that makes the model locally unidentifiable or locally identifiable, excuse me. Um, in, in posing the model here, uh, the analyst must make the constraint or choose the solution that makes most sense. And so the solution that in most cases uh, tends to make more sense is one where the absorption rate constant is much faster than the elimination rate constant. And by imposing that constraint in the model, um, or by rejecting solutions that don't follow this constraint, um, the, the model is, is, is still a useful model, even though it's only locally identifiable. Of course, one way to make this globally identifiable would be to add a different data source. So adding intravenous data as well as extravascular data would now make these parameters uniquely identifiable. Uh, and then assuming that you're estimating those simultaneously. If bioavailability is estimated, then the model becomes unidentifiable because V and F cannot be uniquely estimated separately. There's a, an infinite number of combinations there. So again, um, that, that's an example of uh, an unidentifiable solution, uh, except when we do add additional data sources. So if we have sampled intravenously as well as extravascularly, then, then we can estimate the uh, F independently, and that becomes an identifiable system. So this is an example showing you how systems can, the same model here could be globally identifiable, locally identifiable, or unidentifiable, depending upon the data sources used to support the estimation of the parameters. Now we'll think about the a posteriori identifiability issues. Um, and this is really more experimental design related. For example, parameters for a PK model with nonlinear elimination, um, such as a Michaelis Menten type model, uh, those are maybe unidentifiable due to an inadequate range of doses investigated. Uh, potentially, the doses are, are well below saturation or maybe well above saturation, and uh, some of the parameters of that model might be um, well ill-informed or, or not, not properly supported by the data. Uh, and so a different experimental design might uh, solve that problem because the model is not necessarily unidentifiable mathematically. It's just unidentifiable based on the study design a posteriori. Parameters for a two-compartment model are maybe unidentifiable given the absence of PK sampling during the distribution phase. So here's a picture of that um, scenario where we have PK data and, and the solid line indicates the true concentration time relationship and the blue X's represent the sampling points. Well, you see there's this whole phase here, this grayed out component where there are, are no samples taken. Uh, so although that a two compartment model um, with a single elimination mechanism uh, is identifiable uh, a, a priori, uh, the study design here does not allow the identification of that two compartment system a posteriori. So I've introduced the problem there. Uh, maybe there's um, 
some solutions to that or some strategies you might undertake. So for the a priori identifiability problem, well, one is to explore that through simulation. And remember we said that a priori identif identifiability results in a unique set of parameters if it's global um, or a finite set of parameters if it's locally identifiable um, under a, a um, perfect study design. So one way to, to simulate this is to, is to simulate a very good study design, simulate extensive data under a given model using the same input-output design as in the study. Okay, and then fit the simulated data with varying initial parameter estimates. Now, if this is a globally identifiable system, you have enough data here, and assuming that the measurement noise is not overwhelmingly large, um, you should be able to achieve convergence to the same parameter estimates, no matter what your initial parameters were here. Of course, there's always the issue of local minimum in the search, uh, but um, that, that's not... Uh, a symptom of, of the uh, a priori identifiability. Um, that's, that's another um, issue. But assuming you've reached the global minimum, the solution for that global minimum should be a unique set of parameters. Uh, in the case of the flip-flop model, well, you might have uh, a finite number of solutions. In, this, in that particular example, there are two solutions to the model. Um, if, for example, though, you run this simulation study and uh, obtain similar objective function values, but widely varying final parameter estimates, that may be telling you that you have a, um, a, an infinitely um, broad range of potential solutions or a unidentifiable system from an a priori point of view. There's also some mathematical theory to uh, determine uh, the identifiability of model parameters. Uh, in linear models, it's, it's a little more straightforward, but in nonlinear models like we typically deal with in pharmacokinetics, uh, it's not so straightforward. And, and uh, there have been some research efforts to develop tools that will allow us to explore the relationships between uh, identifiability of parameters under complex models. And I've, we've listed a few of those software packages here. We're not going to teach that software in this course. Uh, and uh, uh, however, uh, we we would probably recommend that if you have a complex enough model, it's it's probably worthwhile to uh, to explore the model structure at least at the population mean level. Uh, most of these models are uh, these tools are not um, designed to support estimation of random effect variances and so on. But at least from a structural model parameter point of view, you could apply these tools to uh, get a good hint about uh, a priori identifiability. Um, still, simulation is a pretty good way to approach this, too. So what are some of the solutions, then, for a system that is not identifiable? Well, one, one way to, s to solve this is to simplify the model. And that might be to simplify the model such that it becomes mathematically identifiable, or maybe to simplify the model so that it uh, accommodates the lack of data in the, in the design, so it's a posteriori identifiable. Um, of course, the first step in all this is to make sure that the model is mathematically or a priori identifiable. Uh, another way to solve this is to fix the parameters in question so that uh, that multiple solution or the infinite solution problem from uh, an a priori identifiability uh, context is not an issue. Uh, and that's some, a strategy that we often take in, into, into account. We'll talk about that one in more detail next week when we're, we're dealing with parent metabolite data or plasma urine data. Of course, we don't have to fix the parameters exactly. We can include prior information on some of those unidentifiable parameters using uh, formal inclusion of uh, informative priors in, in Bayesian-type analysis. Or uh, probably the best solution is to modify the study design, um, either to improve its performance from an a posteriori identifiability or to make the system mathematically identifiable to begin with. So as we mentioned, that first example with the two-compartment model, if we had added sampling from the peripheral compartment, that would have gone from a mathematically unidentifiable system to a mathematically identifiable system. 
Now, that doesn't mean that that system was also a posteriori identifiable because depending upon the sampling times and the, and the density of sampling, uh, the parameters may still be poorly defined under that experiment. So in addition to adding a different site um, to sample from uh, collecting a uh, sufficient number of samples and informatively time samples is also important. Obtaining data from another route of administration is another example. We talked about that uh, as, an, as a solution potentially to the uh, estimation of uh, oral bioavailability. Collecting metabolite data, if we have a, a multi-analyte system, of course, is, uh, is going to be important and is necessary for um, a priori identification of parent metabolite systems. And even metabolite data by itself does not ensure a priori identifiability of those systems. So anyway, the, these are issues that are going to come up as we um, deal with more complex models, and uh, you should be sensitive to them uh, and um, uh, keep in the back of your mind that uh, the, this elegant model you might pose to, to describe a system uh, may not be um, identifiable. You know, there are some other symptoms, too, that you're going to see that, that are not necessarily indicative of identifiability but could be related to that. And that would be in, as, as we review the monitoring of search during a, a gradient-based algorithm. You'll see the gradients uh, either flipping to zero or flip-flopping all over the place to large value, then small value, and so on. Um, and uh, that can be indicative of, of both types of, of parameter identifiability problems. Um, Oftentimes we attribute it to a posteriori identifiability, but if, if, uh, if you simplify the model or if, if you um, uh, continue to collect data and that problem still exists, you have to question the a priori identifiability of the system in the first place. Okay, I'm going to shift gears now and talk about nonlinear PK. Um, this, is, um, this is an area where identifiability can play a role. Uh, in particular, um, the a posteriori type, um, but um, we'll talk about the impact there uh, as we get into an example. The characteristics of nonlinear PK systems are, are pretty clear. Pharmacokinetic parameters such as uh, of, of linear systems are, 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 are different than nonlinear. In linear systems, clearance and volume are independent of, of concentration. They remain constant with respect to dose and time. Superposition applies to drug concentrations. That means we can predict multiple dosing or uh, uh, exposures uh, across doses by simply adding up uh, expected exposures uh, under uh, single dose uh, or lower doses. Uh, area under the curve in increases proportionally to dose. Uh, so would see steady state average um, increase proportionally to dose rate. These are classic linear PK assumptions and, uh, and actually uh, principles that, that are often made when we analyze pharmacokinetics using simple approaches such as non-compartmental approaches or simple linear PK system models. When we move to the nonlinear case, though, uh, things change. It may be that the compartmental pharmacokinetic parameters are no longer constant, and they may change as a function of concentration or dose, uh, and they might change over time. Superposition does not apply under, under the condition of nonlinear PK. Uh, you can't predict multiple dosing from a single dose by just adding up expected uh, exposures. Derived parameters such as AC and C steady state average usually increase disproportionately to dose or dose rate. And these are these are telltale signs of nonlinear systems. We can think about nonlinearity in terms of dose or concentration versus time. And sometimes these are actually related and caused by the same thing, but uh, uh, there are some different uh, causes. So dose dependency here occurs when PK parameters change with dose or concentration. And the typical examples of those 
are drugs like uh, phenytoin and ethanol. In fact, you know that all, all drugs exhibit, any drug that, that's eliminated through, through some uh, protein or enzymatic uh, or capacity-based system uh, is, going to be, uh, is going to exhibit nonlinear pharmacokinetics at a particular concentration range. Uh, it just so happens that, that for the most case, in most cases, uh, we're using drugs at concentrations that are much less than those which would, which would result in nonlinear um, PK. Time dependency is a, a little bit of a different scenario where PK parameters change due to some biochemical or physiologic change uh, in the organ or the system used uh, or responsible for elimination of that drug or transport of the drug. And some examples of that, uh, classic ones, include autoinduction of hepatic metabolism, such as uh, that by uh, carbamazepine, uh, maybe diurnal f variations in, in, in organ function, um, or drug-induced uh, toxicity to the clearing organs, such as aminoglycoside effects uh, on nephrotoxicity. They inhibit their own metabolism or their own elimination. Um, there's also time-dependent processes that also might exhibit dose dependency, and, and, and oftentimes they, they may appear to be one versus the other. Uh, uh, for example, uh, you might have single-dose pharmacokinetics that seem to be linear within a, within a restricted dose range, uh, but then uh, as you go to multiple dosing, it appears to become nonlinear. Well, that could be due to some, some time dependency or some, some mechanistic change over time in uh, biochemistry or physiology, or it could just be due to accumulation and, and uh, concentrations that are now reaching a nonlinear range for whatever the system might be. So um, it sometimes can be tricky there to, to determine whether or not it's a true concentration dependence or some true time-dependent uh, non-stationary pharmacokinetic system. Uh, so understanding mechanism is pretty important here to, in, in order to, to model these systems correctly. In addition, um, you have to think about the different components of PK here. So absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. Uh, they're all potential um, causes of the nonlinearity. And so some very solid uh, ADME type uh, research, basic research, is important in understanding the potential mechanisms and, of course, in modeling that mechanism. So here's some examples, just a table. Um, of different types of uh, nonlinear systems, nonlinear non pharmacokinetic systems, uh, by different causes, either absorption, distribution, metabolism, or excretion. So, for example, riboflavin um, exhibits saturation in, in gut wall transport, um, whereas alprenolol has saturable hepatic first pass metabolism. So, on that uh, oral absorption, you might find that. And so again, you know, different sources of data might help you to, to identify this too. If you have saturable hepatic first pass after oral dosing, you might look at the pharmacokinetics intravenously and uh, help to, to uh, discern the mechanism that way. Distribution, of course, uh, plasma protein binding can be saturated as well as tissue binding. Um, in the metabolic side, there are all kinds of examples. Um, capacity limited clearance or auto induction. We mentioned carbamazepine before. Um, Saturoplasma protein binding uh, for drugs that have binding sensitive clearances. Drugs that have uh, high extraction ratios might uh, might have pharmacodynamic effects like like propranolol, uh, which alters hepatic blood flow and can increase um, uh, or decrease clearance in that way. Um, excretion is also, uh, we're talking about renal excretion here, uh, where you have active mechanisms which might be saturable. Um, you might have uh, a drug that changes uh, pH in the urine, thereby changing ionization state of the, uh, of the um, filtered moiety. Uh, so there, there's all kinds of mechanisms involved here, and that's, this is where some good basic ADME research is helpful in proposing the um, particular type of modeling strategy. Some other uh, experimental considerations for assessing um, nonlinear dose-dependent pharmacokinetics. Um, 
is to administer a series of increasing doses exceeding what we'd expect the clinical range for the possibility of nonlinearity. Plotting observed concentrations versus time on semi-log graphs. This is a classic one for nonlinear clearance. And that your typical log linear relationship that you see on the uh, semi-log plot now becomes sort of a con concave downward shape uh, in the terminal um, phase of that um, concentration time profile or the log concentration time profile. That's a classic indication of saturable nonlinear clearance. We can plot dose normalized concentration time profiles. Uh, if it's nonlinear, of course, those won't be superimposable. Same sort of thing with AUC or C steady state average. Um, determining between uh, dose and time dependent variability um, requires studying single dose levels over, over multiple doses or single dose studies across multiple levels of doses. And um, you have to have a sufficient range of doses and a sufficient range of time to, to determine, uh, or at least to, to get some idea of which, which mechanisms uh, might be more important. So one of the most important um, mechanisms of nonlinearity is capacity-limited elimination. As I mentioned before, all drugs that uh, have some mechanism mediated by um, uh, binding of some sort, whether it's binding to an enzyme or a transporter, uh, they all undergo this sort of saturation. It just happens that uh, most drugs are studied or used clinically uh, at ranges of concentration that are well below those that reach saturation. But some don't. Some are used right within this range of nonlinearity. And so here's what happens. Here's Consider the Michaelis-Menten equation for uh, re really for enzyme kinetics, where we have V, the velocity or the rate of metabolism, V max, the maximum rate of metabolism uh, under uh, ideal situations uh, at infinite concentration. Uh, C is, of course, the concentration of the substrate or the, or the drug here. And Km is um, the concentration at which the rate of metabolism is half of V max. Clearance here uh, is related to these by that ratio of the velocity to concentration. Okay, or in other words, V max divided by concentration plus Km. Let's see what happens with different scenarios here. So let's look at the, the different extremes of concentration relative to Km. If you have low concentration of drug, so much lower than Km, um, which is the case for, for most drugs uh, in use clinically today, we see that, the, that uh, C becomes ne negligible in the denominator, right? So Km is much larger than concentration. So what ends up happening here is that clearance now becomes constant, Vmax divided by Km. So it's independent of clearance. And the ratio here is a constant. However, when we have uh, higher concentrations of drugs, so drug concentration is much greater than Km, now Km becomes negligible and clearance becomes now concentration dependent where clearance is equal to Vmax divided by C. So this is now a saturable zero order clearance which is dependent upon concentration. And of course there's that area in between the two, you know, concentrations that are slightly above Km uh, to, to maybe a, a couple of orders of magnitude above Km where you have that, that changing relationship between the linear contribution and the nonlinear contribution of clearance. Okay, before we move to implementation, I'm going to answer a few questions about causes of nonlinearity, if there are any. Okay, no, looks like there are no questions. Uh, and also, I've got a message here that the sound seems to be fine now. So um, hopefully that's, that's alleviated. For any of you who, who uh, had to um, stop listening, uh, you know, the recordings are not based on the broadcast sound. They're based on internal sound here, so they should not be uh, reflective of the audio problems you were having today. Okay, how do we implement these models? Well, nonlinear system models um, require a, um, 
description of the model in a differential equation system. Uh, it's not an analytically tractable system. In other words, there's no closed form solution for the concentration in the central compartment when you have a nonlinear pharmacokinetic system. Uh, so what we need to do is move to numerical integration of differential equations. In non-MEM, there are some special tools for this. One is ADVAN 10, which is a, a fixed nonlinear model for a one compartment IV input with saturable elimination. Um, it's there, hardly ever used. What we usually use are the general differential equation specifications, and those can be found in ADVAN 6, 8, 9, and 13. And uh, these require specification uh, of some new blocks in the control stream. There's a dollar model block, which defines the number of compartments, uh, the names of the compartments, which ones might be default for dosing and observations, so on. There's a DES block, that's the differential equation specification. That's the most important part of the system because it defines the structural um, relationship of uh, the observed and predicted variables based on a set of differential equations. We have um, an option to set the tolerance for that integration interval. Uh, we can talk about that in a little more detail. That's available in the dollar subroutine or dollar tall. Um, but um, in general, what we're going to be most concerned about here are specifying the model compartments in dollar model and the differential equations themselves in dollar DES. Uh, as is the case with all of the general models, that includes ADVAN 5 and 7, which are general linear models uh, using a matrix exponential solution, as well as ADVAN 6, 8, 9, and 13, uh, and ADVAN 10, only trans 1 may be used. So in other words, the models are written in terms of microconstants. Uh, NMTRAN does not understand anything except for microconstants for these models. You can certainly reparameterize models in terms of physiologic clearance and uh, volume and intercompartmental clearance, but those have no uh, known meaning to NMTRAN when you're using these ADVANs. So uh, um, rather than echo all of the documentation in non -MEM, um, I'm going to point you to the help. And in fact, we'll go take a look at the help for a few minutes uh, just to, to identify some of these um, uh, components of the control stream. So let's go to um, SIMI and uh, I've already got one of these control records pulled up here. This is the subroutine specification and this is where we need to define the name of the library that's going to be used, the ADVAN and, and the uh, transroutine. Remember um, for the differential equation ADVANs you have a choice of the different solution types, uh, but you only have one choice for the trans routine, and that's trans one. There is an option called tall here, and that's what I want to talk about. Tall is uh, a specified variable that defines the number of required digits in the um, integration step size. So tolerance here is um, is inversely proportional to the uh, integration step size. The, the, the larger the tolerance, the smaller the numerical integration step size. Uh, so you could imagine then a very large tolerance is a much more rigorous numerical integration or less approximate than would be a, a small tolerance value. Now the exact number itself, uh, it's hard to translate to the, to the integration step size, but it does have that inverse relationship. So if, has, if you have a system that's highly nonlinear or rapidly changing uh, in concentration time relationships over over the um, data collection period, you probably want to use a tall that's that's a good number, a large enough number. Um, you know, maybe seven, eight, twelve. Uh, that that might be a good starting point. Uh, a default starting point might be three, and that might be for a very simple system that's not that's not nonlinear. Um, maybe just a linear PK system that you're using uh, numerical integration uh, for some other reason. Uh, but, you know, we should be careful in specification of, of um, the tolerance um, because uh, it will impact the numerical solution of that differential equation, which then impacts your prediction model. 
Another rule of thumb is that tolerance should be much larger than the significant digits you're requesting on the estimation line. Um, so if you're by default, non-mem requires uh, stability in the search at three significant digits. Um, and if that's the case, then you're going to want a tolerance step size that um, uh, is much larger, uh, six or seven or so. Um, you never want the opposite to happen where you specify a tolerance of three, but you ask for significant digits of four. Uh, that's going to lead to difficulty because now you're asking for, for more precision in your parameter estimates than you are in the actual numerical integration. And there's some discussion of that on the NM users um, discussion board as well as in some of the uh, 9 mem 7 uh, um, postings lately. Um, a few other things we might want to talk about. We might want to look at the different uh, control streams. Now let's actually look, since we're here, we'll look at dollar DES. So this is the part of the control stream where we define the differential equation structure. Um, for those of you who are used to writing differential equations, usually you start out by specifying the initial conditions and then the parameters and components that specify the rate of change. Well, in non-mem, we don't have to write the initial condition part. All we're doing is writing the components that specify the change, the rate of change. Um, initial conditions in non-mem are specified, well, through a couple of mechanisms. In the old days, it was only specified through the, through the data records. So the dose was supplied in the data, and that became the initial condition for um, the pharmacokinetic system model. But there's also a new variable now since non-mem 6 that allows us to specify the initial values in uh, the control stream. So we can initialize in the control stream or the data set, but it's not initialized in the differential equation block. Here's an example for a simple two compartment model. It's a um, model, actually it's one compartment disposition with first order absorption. Those are your two compartments. DADT1 represents the rate of change in drug concentration in some depot compartment. It's a, it's a, obviously a dose was given here and there's some, some loss there. Uh, parameter three is, is probably a, um, a rate constant here. So that might be like a first order absorption rate constant. And so then DADD2 is equal to that P8 parameter three or the, the rate constant in times A1 minus the rate constant out times A2. So very, very simple, straightforward um, implementation of, uh, of rate constants. Remember, DADT is by default a, um, uh, an implementation of a change in amount over time. That's why it's DADT, uh, although we could uh, pose the system in terms of concentrations and, and model a DCDT. Um, but the default specification is a change in amount over time, just like all of the other analytical advans that come in PREDPP. So you, if you have a, a model structure um, in dollar DES, you need to define a differential equation for each compartment. DADT1 is from compartment 1, DADT2 from compartment 2, and so on. You can actually define um, extra compartments. They may not be part of your prediction model, but, but used for other purposes for numerical integration of, a, of something else that's used in the model. Um, but you, you must have at least the number of differential equations that you have uh, in PK structural model um, compartments. Uh, so there's, there's more on the help system here. Uh, I'm going to go to the um, dollar model specification to show you what needs to be coded there. Dollar model is the place where we specify the number of compartments. Uh, if we have any equilibrium compartments, that has to do with ADVAN 9. Um, if we have um, names of the compartments, particular attributes, and so on. Um, so an example might be something like this. We have number of parameters equals 3, or number of compartments equals 2 in this case. Uh, we specify that we name them, and the order in which we name them is the order in which they are numbered. So this first one on the left here is going to be compartment one. That's the depot. It's default for dose, and it's initially off. The second compartment, compartment two, is the central, 
and it's default for observation and it cannot be turned off. So these are some specifications we're setting here. You don't have to specify those. You, you do need a name of some sort, um, but uh, you can specify dosing and turning compartments on and off through the data set like you always would with Bread PP. Um, so there's more options here, but the compartment is usually a very simple implementation. Take a look, take a look at the uh, dollar model for more detail there. Plus we also have some examples implemented. Uh, the other thing I wanted to show you was the prep BP routines for differential equations. Um, let's go back to the main, here we go. Um, so Advan 6, 8, and 13, these are all general routines that allow us to implement nonlinear models or general nonlinear models through um, numerical solution of a series of differential equations. Um, the, the rationale here is that we can use different numerical solvers um, for different types of systems. And so, there are, as you know, there are different mechanisms or different uh, methods for, for numerical integration of, of differential equations. Advan 6 uses something called the Runge-Kutta method, which is a classic differential equation solver that is useful in a non-stiff system. And I'll, and I'll discuss what that means later. Advan 8 uses um, Gears method for stiff equations and is focused on uh, or better impl implementation for a stiff uh, combination of differential equations. And then Advan 13 is, uses LSODA, which is a modern uh, differential equation solver. It's almost an, what you call an intelligent solver which uses different methods depending upon uh, what type of system or components of, of the system. Uh, so it's, it may be preferable with a, with a mixed system and, and might be preferable almost in all cases. Uh, by the way, a stiff system is one in which there are widely changing magnitudes of um, concentration or rate constants um, across the model. Uh, between compartmental um, differential equations. So one, one equation might be changing very rapidly, whereas another compartment might be quite quite uh, uh, constant over that time, uh, at least relatively so. Uh, that would be a stiff system. A non-stiff system is one where, where all of the differential equations are changing at about the same rate. Um, and so that's one where you could use a simpler solution like the Runge-Kutta method. How do you know which one you have? Um, that's hard to tell. Um, you can try uh, all three of these methods and look for those that seem to converge more quickly or be a little bit more stable. Or just jump right into Advan 13 to start, which, which should be able to handle either type of system. Um, review. Um, the, the other basic PK parameters or additional PK parameters, they're the same thing that we can do with all other compartmental models in PredPP. Um, so the scale, the, the, the bioavailability fraction, input rates or duration of input, lag times, that's all there too. Um, it's just the way that the, the system model is solved is different. Again, just a, a hint, this, this is echoing what I was talking about before, that the tolerance uh, option in subroutine may need to be uh, increased, particularly with Advan 13, Advan 8 as well sometimes. Um, uh, so values of 7 or 8 are not unreasonable. Okay. Initial conditions are also defined here too. And um, you can learn more about that. There's a compartment initialization block here which allows us to define uh, initialization. There's, there's a parameter called A0 flag or A0, um, which is the initialization for a particular compartment. And that can be used to set initial conditions um, in the control stream rather than the data set. So in any case, we don't need to set any uh, initial conditions here other than dosing records and so we're going to use dosing records for the examples in class this week. 
So take a look at the non-MEM help on those topics. I think those are the ones that are most relevant to this particular uh, topic session. Um, if you have questions, post them to the discussion board and we can dig a little bit deeper there. Let's get back to the course. And uh, here we are. And I wanted to show you an implementation here of uh, a nonlinear pharmacokinetic system. This is a two compartment IV infusion uh, model with parallel nonlinear and linear clearance pathways. This is something we see typically in um, the pharmacokinetics of monoclonal antibodies. Just as a snapshot, of, we've given you a data set here for one individual. And this looks pretty straightforward. There's nothing here that really tells you that this is a nonlinear system. Uh, in fact, if you saw this data set, uh, you wouldn't know anything about the, the structure of the model other than the fact that, it's, that there's a, an input, a constant rate input, uh, um, but there, there's nothing here that indicates a nonlinear pharmacokinetic system. In fact, you'd use the same data set for a linear pharmacokinetic model. Things get a little different in the control stream. So we're going to model now a uh, nonlinear system with two mechanisms of elimination. Um, the subroutine we're using is ADVAN6. Uh, TRANS1 is the default, and tolerance equals 8. So the tolerance is, is bumped up a bit here, here on ADVAN6, and that's usually through trial and error. Um, uh, it's p possible that, uh, that you could also entertain a different solver here. But we're going to go pretty simple here with ADVAN6. Um, the model has um, 10 parameters in the model, two compartments, and the compartments are called central and peripheral. And it just so happens the central is the default for observation and it's the default for dosing. Uh, but if you use the CMT item in the data set, you can override those. We specify a PK block, and the only thing we're doing here is, is defining the parameters. So this is going to be a model that has both a Vmax KM type elimination and a linear clearance. So first we define the Vmax, which is equal to some typical value scaled by weight with some uh, allometric relationship um, or a power model. Um, and so the, the individual Vmax is that typical value with an exponentiated eta. There's a KM estimated. The KM is just estimated at the population level here. And that's often the case. It's very difficult to estimate individually the Vmax KM, although it is a uh, mathematically identifiable system. Uh, a posteriori identifiability of those individual random effects is sometimes quite difficult unless you have exquisite, exquisite data within subjects so a large range of concentrations within each subject. That's usually not, not the case. So what we might need to do is simplify the model and drop the inter-individual random effect on KM. Then we specify the linear clearance, CLL. Uh, again, a fixed effect with a power weight model uh, with an inter-individual random effect entering exponentially. Uh, volume and distribution has the same sort of structure uh, for the central compartment, the peripheral compartment as well. Uh, we're not going to estimate inter-individual random effects on the peripheral compartment volume or Q, the intercompartmental clearance. Now notice that even though this is ADVAN 6 trans 1, we're still defining parameters in terms of, of names such as Vmax or clearance or volume. Well, recall that, that Nunman doesn't understand any of these things. And we'd have to map those back to, um, to the model somehow. That's going to be done in the differential equation block. We also identify the scaling factor here. Scale S1 is equal to V1. That just tells us that the observations are in compartment one and uh, it's an IV system that makes sense. And so that the scale for that amount in compartment one is equal to the volume. In the differential equation block, we're gonna define first um, the concentrations of the two compartments. And this is one approach here where we wanna look at a concentration time change. Um, and so C1 is going to be equal to the amount in compartment 1, and this is standard notation here. We can capture the amount in any compartment by just specifying A, parentheses, and then the number of the compartment. So A1 divided by V1 is the concentration in compartment 1, and similarly for compartment 2. DADT1 now is the rate of change of 
the concentration, we're going we're gonna to use this in terms of concentration, in compartment one as a function of time. And so if we recall now, since we have a, a multi-component elimination here, we have a saturable component and a linear component, uh, again, uh, often uh, seen with monoclonal antibodies where you have that target-mediated saturable piece and also the more linear um, mechanisms of elimination from the RES-type systems. Um, we have a Vmax times concentration divided by a Km plus concentration. Of course, that's negative because we're eliminating from the central compartment. And then we have another elimination or negative term here, which is the um, linear clearance. And then we also have um, elimination, not elimination, but, but distribution to the peripheral compartment. That's Q times C1. And then we also have the return from the peripheral compartment. That's the only thing that's being added to this system is return back from the peripheral. That's Q times C2. The peripheral compartment is simply the um, flux from the central coming in or minus the exit from the peripheral. So that's the specification of this, of this model. is a two compartment disposition with a dual mechanism of elimination. That's a differential equation block. The rest of the, the model here, dollar error, dollar estimation tables, that's all going to be the same as, as you're used to. Okay. You'll find this example here in, in the uh, examples which are posted in a zip file under ADVPK1, Advanced PK1, examples, nonlinear clearance. And there's an R um, script to run this as well as a um, control stream. Here's a... Um, Here's an implementation of a time-dependent model. So this is a one-compartment IV infusion with auto-induction of clearance. The data set here, again, nothing here to tell you that this is a time-dependent pharmacokinetic system. We have uh, the usual columns, a comment, the ID, time, amount. There's an infusion rate and a bunch of observations over time and an event ID column. Same sort of data set you could use for a linear time stationary type system. But now we go to the um, NMTRAN code, and we'll see how this implementation is done in a differential, differential equation block. So subroutine, again, ADVAN6, TRANS1, uh, tolerance 5. Again, remember, this is sometimes re requires some iteration, iteration where you might need to increase the tolerance. Of course, the higher the tolerance, the longer your run times are going to be because you're, you're decreasing that integration step size. Um, so there's a balance there between um, some uh, adequate precision of the numerical integration versus the amount of time it will take your model to run. Uh, number of parameters, there are four, four basic parameters here. There's only one compartment, and the compartment is called one. It's default for dose and default for observation. PK block defines our four required parameters. So we have this thing called baseline clearance, or CLBS, again with a fixed effect and an inter-individual random effect. We have a maximum clearance, the, this is the maximum induced level of clearance, CL max, uh, not to be confused with a Vmax, and this is just a, a, a new set point in this time-dependent model. Um, there's a, um, an induction half-life, uh, or the reciprocal rate constant, or inversely proportional to the rate constant. Um, and we also have a volume distribution. This model is one that assumes an exponentially um, an exponential infusion type relationship uh, between the baseline clearance and the maximum clearance where the clearance asymptotes to a maximum uh, because of the induction of whatever elimination system here. So for example, um, just a model similar to this for carbamazepine auto-induction where, where uh, induction of uh, enzymatic capacity reaches some maximum over time. So how do we code up that time-dependent PK? This is another place where DES is really handy because it's the only place in non-MEM where we can get access to a continuous variable called time. And it's not the time that's in the data set. It's a different value. It's this thing called T here. So clearance is equal to some baseline clearance, 
right? Plus some maximum gain here, the difference between max and baseline. So that's sort of the, the maximum offset you can get over time uh, at an infinite time. And we're going to be modeling that here using this um, exponential infusion type relationship here, 1 minus e uh, to the k t minus kt here, or in other words, minus log of 2 divided by half-life times time. But look at time here. Time is t. t is a variable that is only available in the DES block. It is a, a um, measure uh, or a more... Uh, something that's closer to continuous time, it's a measure of the integration step cycle time. So it's much more um, finite in, in its interval than might be time in your data set. Time in the data set usually is just recorded at times where events are occurring. Something like a dose or an observation or maybe you stick in an event ID 2 and have an other event, but th those are you know big steps usually in time between those things. Uh, Time t here, the integration time, is, is, is practically a continuous time and is, is a more appropriate way to model time-dependent processes in a pharmacokinetic system. So then we define that time-dependent clearance. Uh, we also define concentration as the ratio of the amount in compartment 1 to the volume. And so then simply our DADT1, or the change in concentration over time for compartment 1, is minus clearance times C1, where clearance now is changing as a function of time. Now this is one where, where clearance is changing in a, in a unidirectional manner. Uh, it's not one where clearance is changing, uh, fluctuating up and down as a response to some other response. It's, it's really a, a monotonically increasing clearance. Um, but we could propose other types of, of functions for, for clearance changing over time as well using that similar strategy of some um, numerical expression here um, with uh, t uh, as the integration time or continuous time. Okay, this is a good time to pause for questions um, because next we're going to talk about target-mediated drug disposition. Let me scroll through the question box. One of the questions is uh, that sometimes NAMM comes back with an error statement that tall has been set too large. Um, it's uh, s sometimes uh, you're requiring too much. And it's not necessarily that it's too large, but it may be too large for some of the other constants uh, in, in the integration cycle. Um, yeah, so sometimes you can lower it, or maybe you need to change uh, the integration method. So only trans one can be used with, with these advans. That's correct. Um, if you would like to know what the other trans routines are, just please look at the NAMM help files. Trans one is the um, implementation where uh, all of the parameters are parameterized in terms of micro constants. So K12, K21, and so on. There's no, uh, with trans one, there is no, um, uh, understood value of other PK parameters. And in the differential equation models, you have to explicitly define how the parameters defined in dollar $PK enter the model. You'll notice that all of these parameters are used someplace in dollar $DES or some derived variable from them is used in dollar $DES. Somebody asked about ADVAN 9. ADVAN 9 is another model that you can use it. It also, it's a little more peculiar in that ADVAN 9 allows you to specify equilibrium statements for compartments. So what we're talking about now are rate of change equations in dollar DES. But there's something called dollar AES, which is for uh, equilibrium compartments in ADVAN 9. We're not going to talk about that in this course, but you could look up the help file. Yeah, so more, more questions about setting initial conditions. Um, we can set the initial conditions in the data set, and we use to use the bioavailability fraction. Uh, but there's another way around that, and that's to use, the, as I pointed out before, that A0 um, parameter, which allows us to specify the initial, um, initial values for any compartment in the system through the control stream.
So a question about the parallel system that we just talked about. In your experience, when there is parallel linear and nonlinear, what's the best way to evaluate the saturation of the nonlinear clearance? Now, I'm not sure if what you're talking about there from a modeling point of view or from an experimental design point of view, but um, clearly in order to estimate that combined model, you need to have a concentration range that spans uh, both very low concentrations, uh, which are those around the target um, type uh, magnitude um, so that you, that you can observe that saturation uh, as well as concentrations that extend beyond that um, so that the linear PK becomes evident. Usually that's the case. Unlike uh, small molecules where if you want to observe saturation uh, you need to push the dose higher uh, because usually the hepatic me metabolic systems or renal uh, active transport mechanisms have quite a high capacity relative to therapeutic concentrations. What we often see with monoclonals is the opposite in that that low capacity uh, saturable component is, is possibly related to target mediated mechanisms and uh, that happens at the lower end of the range and if you if you uh, overwhelm that then all you, you might see is a linear relationship. Okay, I still don't understand the T in dollar DES. Is it different from time in the data set? Yes, it is definitely different from time. Um, time in the data set is, is a um, user-supplied item. You know, it's, it's essential in the, in the model here, and it's a required data item, but it's, it's supplied by the user at whatever interval the user wants to define it or collect it. So you could collect time you know, once every hour. You could collect time once a day or once a year doesn't matter as long as it's associated with the observation. But when you have these larger gaps between observations with time, uh, that's a big step size. It's a big change. And so if we want to make a PK parameter change as a function of time, if we use time in the data set, we end up with these large step type functions uh, where time, you know, for example, if clearance was a function of time and we've only collected time once a month, what we're essentially saying is that clearance is constant at the current time all the way back to a month before where, where it was some other value. And at that point, it might have changed all the way back to the prior month. So in a period of two months, uh, clearance is only taken on two different values. Whereas if we um, use T, which is a continuous implementation of time, we'd see an essentially continuously changing clearance over time over that two-month period. So time in the data set is, is really uh, an ordered categorical variable, um, whereas time in uh, differential equation block is a continuous measure of time. Okay, a few more questions. For the nonlinear clearance example, why can't we eliminate the linear clearance component? Um, you might be able to, and it again, again depends upon your experimental design relative to the concentrations necessary to saturate the nonlinear system. Uh, if, for example, it's a monoclonal antibody and you're studying this at, at very low concentrations that haven't even approached or are just starting to approach saturation, you may not, uh, you may not be able to identify that linear component. Um, but most of the times uh, in monoclonals, uh, you, you are... Uh, overwhelming that, that low capacity target mediated system and, and you, you do see both or sometimes just a linear component. Um, again, that's, that's an a posteriori identifiability problem that's based on the experimental design, the range of data that you have. It's not a mathematical identifiability problem. Okay. Okay, lots of questions again about T and time. I think I've clarified that. Um, yeah, so somebody just summarized it here. That t the time ranges from uh, zero, basically, or, or your, your first record in time to the maximum record in time with, with as, as the... A student here puts it with just tiny step size, and that's that's right, with with nearly continuous um, step size. Okay.
Good questions. Let's shift gears to the next topic. Okay, one last question before we move on. What defines the step size? That's defined in tolerance. Okay, and so the higher the value of tall, the smaller the step size. That's why I said if we specify a value that's too large, sometimes the run times may be increasingly long. Uh, so you have to find that, that balance between the in integration step size versus the, the timing and frequency of the change of concentration in your system uh, and also the observation times. It's really a trial and error process. There's not a uh, there's no magic uh, formula to determine what tall should be, um, but um, if you understand what it's doing, then you can get an idea of which way it's trending, and tr to try some different values. Okay, uh, last topic for today is target mediated drug disposition, and um, this is consistent with, the, with this topic because it's a specific mechanism of nonlinear PK, but where the binding of drug to its pharmacologic target influences the distribution and or elimination um, due to high affinity binding and, and usually a low capacity, a limited number of targets within the distribution space. So uh, one example um, would be receptor-mediated endocytosis, where a drug binds to a target receptor and it triggers internalization and degradation of the drug or the drug receptor complex. So it's one of the mechanisms of elimination of that drug. It just happens to be related to the actual uh, pharmacologic target of the drug. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, unlike small molecules, which often exhibit linear PK, at least during um, through the therapeutic range, uh, Nonlinear PK is commonly observed for biologics and often attributed to this target-mediated mechanism. There's lots of examples of this, um, therapeutic monoclonal antibodies, also recombinant proteins, um, and so on. We can uh, model this in a sort of simplistic way, more um, uh, a simplified version or empirical relationship using Michaelis-Menten model which we, was the same one that we talked about for the nonlinear PK example. Or we could use a more mechanistic <clears throat> implementation where we consider the full target-mediated drug disposition. I'll explain that in a minute. Or also making a simplification. Remember, again, the, the solution to identifiability sometimes is to simplify the model. And uh, that might be done under some assumptions of uh, either equilibrium or steady state. The last point here is important. Uh, understanding the physiology and pharmacology of the underlying system uh, is really necessary to propose these types of models. So if you don't have that understanding, um, you could propose uh, all kinds of model structures here. And, and uh, uh, in order to get some meaning out of these uh, matching them to their mechanism is, is usually uh, an important part. So here's a diagram of the entire, um, what we call the full target-mediated drug disposition model. Let's start on the left side where you have the pharmacokinetics of, of your drug in question. Might be a monoclonal antibody. But you have um, a central compartment with a volume distribution, an elimination rate constant, you have a peripheral compartment, possibly, uh, with distribution back and forth, um, and some input. Here we're, we have input into the central, maybe we have intravenous input. Well, that's the drug disposition by itself if there were no target molecules in the system. But the drug is actually designed to bind to a target. So you have to consider then that there's target, and we'll start with free target. Let's say target might be a membrane-bound uh, protein. It could be a soluble target, soluble protein target. Um, but let's let's um, imagine that there's some free target available, and that target is being formed at some synthesis rate and, and uh, uh, eliminated according to some degradation rate, whatever the mechanism. Okay, and so we have our um, what we're doing here is we're setting up our tip, setting up our typical binding isotherm where we have free drug and free target, or in other words, uh, if you equate this to, to binding, you have uh, free drug and free receptor. Um, 
that will associate potentially depending upon the affinity of that target of, of the drug for the target um, and uh, that rate of association is gri driven by these relative rates of change uh, first order uh, association constant k on or the first order um, binding constant from free drug and free target to become a drug target complex versus the k off rate constant uh, which puts the system back from the a drug receptor complex to, to the free quantities of target and drug. Well, we can we could try to model this entire system. There's lots of parameters here. Um, let's think about um, a simple case. Well, we're going to use this two compartment disposition. And we have all of these microconstants to deal with, right? So, for a central compartment concentration, we have some input. Um, which is the initial condition in non-MEM, of course, we, we would uh, specify that as some infusion or some dosing record. Uh, but then we have elimination here. So we have, um, well, first minus K on times um, the free drug and the target plus K off which now dissociates that drug target complex back to free target and drug minus then the elimination rate constant and the transfer constant to the peripheral compartment times free drug concentration plus K21, which is the concentration coming from the peripheral compartment to the central compartment. Okay, so we've, we've, we've modeled here for everything that's, that's affecting free drug here. It includes its kinetic distribution and elimination and binding and also release from that drug receptor complex. Compartment 2 is just a peripheral compartment. That's pretty straightforward. Compartment R here, or the third compartment, is interesting. That's the receptor or the target. And so again, the target then is lost as it's associating with free drug and moving over to the drug receptor complex. Okay, so that's its negative. And there's also a degradation component, so there's a minus k-deg times free target, r. But there's also um, a gain here in this system by um, dissociation of the drug target receptor complex, time, so that, that complex times k off. Um, and also an input through k sin, which might be a zero order uh, constant rate formation of that uh, target. The reason I say it's zero order is, is you see it's not dependent upon a concentration here. And then we also have um, the elimination or the, the, I'm sorry, the time course for the drug receptor or the d drug target complex. And that's influenced by K on and the concentration of free drug and free target minus K off times that drug receptor complex. And again, minus K internalization potentially or whatever mechanism for elimination uh, of that drug receptor complex times the concentration of the, of the complex. So if you could imagine all of these mechanisms happening and, and specifying the model this way, it, it, it's pretty straightforward, it makes sense. Um, but there are a lot of parameters here. Um, just a few caveats about the uh, units and so on. Uh, I'll let you read those later, but they're pretty pretty uh, straightforward. Note that all rate constants are first order except for K-sin, so I pointed that out. And K-on, which is a second order, that's a good point to, to bring up here. K-on is a second order rate constant in that you have now two quantities being multiplied together here, concentration of free drug and concentration of free target times K-on. That's a second order rate constant. So some assumptions in this model that the drug target binding is a one-to-one -one interaction with only one type of drug target complex formed. Now you could, if you knew that, that it was a bivalent uh, type of interaction, you, you could potentially uh, adjust for that too. Um, we also assume that drug target binding occurs only in the central compartment. We're driving that relationship off of the central compartment drug concentration. Uh, this is the only target that drug binds to. 
Um, that complex is eliminated with no recycling. So the drug target elimination pathway, what we called K-INT, that internalization, leads to destruction of both drug and target. And that the target production and degradation rates are independent of drug target and drug target complex concentrations. You see here, there, none of these um, relationships are saturable. Okay. A posteriori identifiability of this model can be problematic, as you could, as you could assume, um, given all of those rate constants to estimate. And, and what we're saying there can be problematic when we're only observing, for example, plasma concentration of drug uh, or maybe concentration of total um, drug receptor complex. It's difficult to identify these different uh, uh, systems. So in those cases, we might make simplifications of the model. Or we might try to, to capture more data. So to make this um, uh, identifiable, we might want to be able to capture the quantities in all of these compartments. Uh, that's, that's very difficult to do analytically, and uh, it's rare that we have all of those types of data. But if we could observe free concentration, free target, and complex um, peripheral compartment, we don't really need to observe here, uh, that, then that makes this system um, identifiable. Now, there are some simplifications here um, from an a posteriori, a posteriori point of view where we could make some assumptions. One of them is a quasi-equilibrium, quasi or what we might call a rapid binding approximation. There's a couple of references there for you to look a little deeper. We're drug binding to the target, so K on, and dissociation, K off, occur much faster than other system processes. Okay. So what happens then is that the, the free drug, free target, and drug receptor complex are sort of an equilibrium, quasi-equilibrium, um, where, where we could specify the ratio then of K off and K on as a parameter KD, the equilibrium dissociation constant. This is the same constant that's used uh, to estimate binding affinity in vitro and is a nice way to, to link in vitro results to um, this in vivo uh, target-mediated drug disposition model. Remember, in, in vitro, these studies are done at true equilibrium. Um, what we're assuming in, vitro, in vivo here is that you're at quasi-equilibrium. Um, if that assumption is relatively true, then the estimate from the in vivo modeling-based KD parameter estimation could be quite similar to the KD um, determined in vitro. Uh, after accounting for differences in protein binding and so on. So there's a nice um, uh, implementation of that here by Major and Krasansky uh, that you probably want to look at. But remember what we're saying here, this is the full model for, for TMDD. What we're saying is that this process here is so fast that essentially all, all of these components are in equilibrium. And we're going to be estimating an equilibrium dissociation constant, which is the ratio of K off to K on. So that's one simplification. Another simplification is a, an assumption of steady state or quasi steady state. So drug binds to the target K on much faster than other system processes. So everything sort of gets shifted to the right there. Uh, and so the free drug, free target, target and the drug target complex are in quasi steady state. Uh, in other words, the rate of change is zero, right? So K on times free drug times receptor minus K off plus, plus K in times the, the um, drug receptor complex is equal to zero, where it's steady state there, rate in, rate out equals zero. And then we can, so we can set up this, uh, this expression here. So the concentration of free drug times the, the receptor or target divided by the complex is equal to some constant here, um, which is KSS. This constant KSS is called the steady state constant. Um, all the other parameters are the same. Um, this is another way to simplify the model, although it's a little more um, difficult to interpret uh, pharmacologically in that KSS is not something that has uh, an in vitro equivalent. Um, this is assuming some steady state relationship, not equilibrium here, 
So we can't compare that KSS to a KD uh, that might be determined in vitro. And um, this also collapses further to the quasi-equilibrium model when the complex elimination rate is negligible compared to the binding rate. So then, then we get down to the, to the simple KD type model. There's a nice review by uh, Lena Jabansky et al. Um, for, the, for this uh, quasi-steady state model. Again, we're talking about here, this is the full model image. We're talking about a, a case where k on is very rapid uh, relative to the rest here. And so we're essentially um, at steady state between the free drug, free target, and drug receptor complex. We haven't implemented those in non-MEM code for you, although the references we've cited here are pretty explicit about the structure. And given the full model, um, it should be easy to, for you to collapse that down. So let's look at the target mediated drug disposition implementation. Data set, again, pretty straightforward. We're dealing with PK input. So initialization is done through the data record, first record here. Um, and we have concentration time data observed over time. Um, in the control stream, we're going to use, again, ADVAN6, TRANS1, and TOLERANCE4 where we have four different compartments. We have the central compartment. We have the target or receptor. We have the, the drug target complex and the peripheral compartment for PK purposes. This is a pretty simple one here <clears throat> because we've um, uh, simplified the random effects. Uh, you could try to estimate more, but depending upon the data that might become a posteriori identifiable or unidentifiable, um, but we have clearance, VC, Q, and VP. Those are your typical PK parameters. Now we have also the, all of the micro constants. So K, K12, K21. Remember K here um, is the elimination rate constant in the PK system. K12 is the um, transfer to the peripheral. K21 is, is the peripheral back to the central. But then we need to specify the rest of the um, the rest of the PK parameters in in the target mediated component of the model. So we specify what we call the, the baseline. Um, your base is we'll have to check on that ba base. Uh, K int, that's the uh, internalization, so that's the elimination of the um, um, drug receptor complex. K deg is the elimination of free drug. K on is the formation of the complex. K off is the dissociation of the complex. K sin, uh, IC base, is, is, is the baseline observation of, uh, of the free um, target. And this is one where we're going to initialize um, the initial conditions because free target is not zero at time zero. There's some endogenous level. So this is an example of, of initializing that in the control stream where we say that now the k-sin, which is the zero order input, is equal to the base times k-deg, um, or in other words, that base equals the ratio of k-sin to k-deg, right? Um, and so we're going to specify then that the initial conditions for compartment 2, A underscore 0 for compartment 2 is equal to this estimated parameter base. Um, so that's a baseline um, value for free target concentration. This is the same way you would initialize any sort of system model that has a non-zero value at time 0. Then we specify the different compartment rate of change. Uh, again, just follow the... the um, uh, rate constants above um, minus k times a1 minus k on times a2. Um, so those are the loss components. Um, and actually k, k on is actually a second order rate constant because it's a2 times a1. Remember a2 is the um, target and a1 is the drug. And then we have uh, feeding back from the receptor complex, k off times times that value, um, adjusted for volume here, uh, minus k12 
times A1, so that's transfer to the peripheral, and this is return from the, from the peripheral. Then we have uh, DADD2, which is the rate of change for the free target. We have K sin, which, which uh, is a zero order input, and then K deg times the concentration in that compartment, or the concentration of free drug, minus then the association to the drug receptor complex, um, plus what's coming off of that drug receptor complex. DADT3 now is the drug receptor complex. So we have that second order constant K on times, um, times receptor or target times drug concentration divided by volume. And then we have um, K off times K int, uh, plus K int, those are both exits or, or uh, uh, losses from the drug receptor complex compartment times the, the concentration in the drug receptor complex. Um, the ADT4 then is just the peripheral PK compartment. That's pretty straightforward. We can capture um, predictions in any compartment here. Um, we can, we can, can, can capture the uh, uh, con concentration in compartment one or the drug compartment as MY that's equal to A1 divided by VC. Um, and then we can specify some residual error model. So this, in this case here, the way the error block is written, we've only got observations from one compartment, uh, and that's the, the central compartment uh, for uh, free drug. Um, under this sort of a sampling scenario, it's not realistic to expect you're going to be able to estimate all of these parameters. Um, you can try, but uh, the ability to estimate that uniquely is, is going to be highly dependent upon the, the data structure. And um, in fact, uh, most of the reviews I've seen about identifiability of these systems uh, uh, suggest that you should have sampling from all three pools or some way to determine values or, or amounts in all, all three pools. <clears throat> okay, so that's the target mediated uh, implementation. Let's take a look at additional questions. Uh, back to the tolerance setting, does tall have to agree with SIG in estimation? What, what I said earlier is that tall should be greater than SIG. Uh, SIG is the required number of significant digits for uh, estimation convergence. Um, tall should be greater than that. Um, if you have the inverse, if tall is less than SIG, you're going to run into problems because basically what you're saying is that the precision of the integration step size is less than the precision I'm asking for in the parameter estimates, and that's that's not going to work. Um, so you've got to have at least the the level of SIG, usually uh, larger than SIG. Um, if I have observations from multiple compartments, do I need to define the error model differently? Yes, you do, uh, and we talked about that in the class last semester. Uh, but let me let me review that quickly. Um, what we would do here is if we had multiple uh, observations, we would just simply specify another uh, prediction. Uh, so we could have, we could call it C1 equals A1 divided by VC, and then C2 could be equal to A2, uh, and then C3 could be equal to A3, and so on. So we can specify different predictions. For each one of those, then, we're going to have a different uh, residual error model, uh, because there's potentially a different, uh, different analytical assay being used for each one. And we just set up an indicator variable to switch. Um, if the observation is a free drug, then prediction for free drug would be used. If the observation is free target, then the prediction for free target would be used, and so on. So yeah, you have to switch back and forth. We use indicator variables. And uh, we did this uh, extensively last semester in the MI210 class when when we were simultaneously modeling PK and PD data. Okay, let me answer a few more questions. Understanding the concept may be helpful to determine which model to use. Yeah, I think the point there is that understanding the mechanism of the um, target-mediated uh, pharmacology would be very helpful to determine which model to use. Um, 
you might be able to propose alternative models that seem to fit the data well, but may not be consistent with the mechanism. And if we're trying to, to bridge uh, parameter estimates back to in vitro data, uh, you really have to understand the, uh, the underlying uh, mechanisms in order to propose something that makes sense from a parameter inference point of view. Okay. Uh, if you have more questions, go ahead and type them in. For now, uh, I'm going to define your homework. Um, well, first of all, the most important thing for you to do is to complete the exam. So please complete exam one. It's available online. It shouldn't take you too long to do. Um, that needs to be completed by Friday this week. Uh, I'll go easy on the homework in that uh, we've already got these examples put together for you. Um, I'd like you to just run them as is um, and then maybe try a different integration method for one of the models. Okay, so all of them are implemented with uh, ADVAN 6 now, I believe. Try ADVAN 13 or ADVAN 8 and see what happens. Um, we, can, we can run through that uh, during the lab as well. Uh, I'll keep it light then on the homework so that you have time to complete the exam. There's also a paper to read. I post a citation on that on your course site. It's a paper describing parent metabolite and urine um, data uh, modeled simultaneously and some of the issues with parameter identifiability, uh, really focused on the application of, uh, of evaluating uh, these snapshot uh, phenotypic uh, markers. But um, it was also um, used to illustrate um, that parametabolite and, and urine data type modeling. And then please do uh, read the study guide questions. Uh, think about these and uh, maybe, you know, sketch out a few answers. These are the kinds of topics that will be on the next exam. Okay, I'll go back to the questions now for a minute. Okay, so somebody's asking about the residual error model. Um, I pred equals Y here, or versus I pred equals F. Uh, actually, it doesn't matter anymore. In the old non-mem implementation, you couldn't write this. You couldn't write I pred equals Y. You couldn't have. You could not use Y on the right hand side. All this does is it sets the individual prediction equal to whatever the expression is on the right hand side of, of y here. Okay, so you could say i pred equals f or i pred equals y. Now i pred equals f is not going to work in this case uh, because uh, you, you, we're specifying observations from different compartments. So the, the most useful thing would be to be specific about the prediction compartment and that's what's done here. The prediction compartment is compartment 1. It's a1 divided by vc. And so the prediction then is equal to that value, A1 divided by VC, with some, some uh, residual error model. And then all we're saying is that is repeating that equation. But as we know, uh, when we specify IPRED, all we're going to get is the individual specific prediction, not the population prediction, which, which is uh, the default prediction for whatever is to the right of Y. Um, so that's a way to get the individual prediction into the model. We could have also said I pred equals MY here. Um, that's, that's the same thing. Remember, I pred does not include the residual error. OK, one more question about linear and nonlinear clearance. Let me see. Um, we had a linear clearance and nonlinear clearance in the last example. Can the nonlinear clearance alone capture both the linear part and the nonlinear part? Could you please briefly explain it again? Yeah. Well, it depends on the system. So for your typical small molecule saturable metabolism, yes, a nonlinear system could describe both the linear part and the nonlinear part because it's the same mechanism. Okay. In, in the small molecule world, it's one enzymatic system in most cases. And what we're looking at, as, as I said before, all of the small molecule um, metabolism-based eliminations 
follow a Michaelis Menten model. It just so happens that we're usually using them therapeutically at concentrations that are much less than the Km, and so they're linear. Now, if you had a wide enough range in, in that sort of system, you could describe both the linear part and the, and the nonlinear part of the relationship. However, with monoclonal antibodies, we're talking about two mechanisms of elimination here. One of them is the mechanism, let me go back to the diagram. One of them is the mechanism that's related here to free drug elimination, KEL, whatever that might be, maybe uh, just uh, some sort of uh, enzymatic degradation or, or uh, uptake by nonspecific uh, uh, reticular endothelial system, whatever it is, um, it's, it's, it's an elimination of free drug that's not dependent on binding to the target. But there's also a component of the elimination that is dependent on binding to the target, and that's the target-mediated disposition component. And so that one uh, is usually um, subject to constraints on the capacity of this target-mediated system. So you have these two systems. You cannot uh, use one to describe the other. They're two different mechanisms uh, in terms of a monoclonal. Uh, although, as I said before, for a small molecule, um, it is the same system in most cases. It's just different ranges of that same system. Okay. Uh, in DADT1, why do we multiply by VC? Uh, that's because we're just converting back to amounts. Let me find the example. This this is an amount versus time, and so what we're doing here is we're taking this concentration and uh, multiplying it by volume. That gives us the total amount. <clears throat> okay. Well, we're we're um, almost at the end of class here. Um, I apologize for the audio problems initially. Uh, hopefully, that will well. I know that will not be reflected in the recording. Um, and hopefully those of you who missed ha will be able to, uh, to listen to the recording. If there are questions, if, if, if uh, some of this was not clear, please do post questions to the discussion board. We will review these particular examples in the hands-on lab on Friday. Uh, you know your homework assignment uh, for the week, so um, please um, give it a try, and uh, we'll continue uh, learning about this on Friday. If there are no more questions, I think I'm going to sign off now, and I'll talk to you on Friday. Thanks for your attention.